We're so glad that you found this Peak City message today. Our prayer is that during our time together, you're able to discover Jesus and are encouraged to follow him fearlessly. If you've got a Bible and you want to get there, we are in John 16, like I read before, and we're talking about hope. All right, hope. Um, we're going to make this a very interactive sermon in many ways. And one of the ways that I need you to be interactive with me is every time I point to you, you're going to say the word hope, okay? Hope. Better. You'll understand what I mean, why we're doing that in a second, all right? Hope is something that I, I, I honestly, um, I've not preached a lot of sermons on hope because I, up until the last year, year and a half or so, I don't think I really uh, understood hope. Uh, and and, and, I, I, and w- when I thought about hope, it didn't seem like a very strong uh, concept to base your life on, right? There's some things about hope that didn't make sense, but honestly, that's kind of par for the course for me. Um, I, there's a lot of things about Christianity that haven't made sense to me, okay? I, I, I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't grow up with faith. Um, I, didn't, I didn't start following Jesus until the age of 17. And so there was a lot about church life and a lot about Christianity that just didn't make sense to me. So like, I, I remember when I was a kid and we weren't going to church, um, but I was around Christians in my school. I was around families that prayed. And I was so confused because I thought at the end of their prayers when they'd say, amen, I thought they were saying all men. And I'm like, that is so sexist. Like, how dare you not get with the times? There was, they're saying amen, amen, which means we agree. So like, when you say amen at the end of a prayer, it just means you agree with whatever's been praying. Like, I didn't know, but I learned, okay? Um, fast forward to like, whenever I first became a pastor, the very first job I ever had in ministry, I was a youth pastor at a really small church in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. And uh, I'll never forget my first Easter as a pastor. I'd never been a pastor before. I, I didn't know all the traditions that happened in church. And there was this tradition, maybe some of you know it, uh, where on Easter, some of these churches change the way they greet people. They don't say good morning. They say, he is risen. Anybody know what, what happens next? He is risen. Some of y'all grew up in church. I did not. The, the, the tradition, for those that don't know, is it's like this weird call and response thing where they're like, he is risen. And you're supposed to say, he is risen indeed. Well, I didn't know that. And so this sweet little old lady is the door greeter that day. She opens the door and she's like, he is risen. And I said, you bet your bottom dollar he did. <laughs> These are the facts. This is Easter. I was like, I don't know what you want me to say. And she was like, oh no, we have hired a hellion to be our youth pastor. This is not good, right? I didn't know, but I learned, right? I didn't know, but I learned. And with hope, I got to be honest, I, I don't think I knew what hope really meant until the past few years as God has been teaching me what, what hope is. Because when, when you think about hope, you can't read the Bible and not get to the word hope. You can't listen to and sing Christian worship songs and not think about hope. It is everywhere. It is all over the Bible. It is a faith that is centered on hope. And when the Bible talks about hope, it doesn't sound weak. It sounds strong. It sounds central. It sounds like it's priority number one is hope. I mean, think about some of these verses in the New Testament. Just a casual reading of some of these. Uh, Romans 15, 13. May the God of what? Okay, you're getting the hang of it, but we're, we're going to go louder than that. So if the person next to you didn't say hope, you're going to have to elbow them right now. Okay, I saw, I saw the elbows. May the God of hope. better fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. better by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 24 says, for in this hope. we were saved. First Peter 1, 3 says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's everywhere. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, This is like the, the Christian high school graduation party verse. You think like Jeremiah wrote this verse for the high school graduate. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a? Hope. And a future. It's everywhere. Hope is like central to the Christian faith. But here's the, here's the problem that I've had with hope. Almost all of my life as a follower of Jesus is that when I read hope in the Bible, it doesn't match up with the way we talk about hope as 21st century Western Americans. There's a discrepancy that doesn't line up because we don't say hope and mean the same thing, I don't think. Because when we say hope, we say it like, my team's down 30 points at half and they're probably going to lose, but I they come back, right? Broncos fans, y'all think they might make the playoffs. They're not, they're not going to, okay? But you hope that they do, right? Come on, I'm a a Cincinnati Bengals fan. Us us Bengals and Broncos, we got a lot of disappointment in common. We share that. Some of y'all guys went on a date with a girl over the last year and 
the online dating service messed up or something and she was way out of your league, but it matched you up and, and, and she has not called you back after that date. It's been three or four days and your boys know she's, she's done with you, but you, deep down you still hope, but she ain't calling. <laughs> she's moved on, man. <laughs> she's moved on. You hope, right? We, when we say hope today, we think like I, I, I'm, I'm playing the Powerball and I I wake up a millionaire, but I'm probably not going to, right? I just, I, my, my, my family and I just went to go see the, the, um, the new uh, Willy Wonka movie. And then we watched the old Willy Wonka movie. And it's like the whole movie's about hope. I hope I'm one of the five people on the entire planet that get a golden ticket. Probably not going to happen, but I, yeah. Now here's the discrepancy. I just, I, I can't, I can't wrap my head around and I can't come to a place where I believe that the disciples in the New Testament and the heroes of our faith for the past 2,000 years have given their lives to pass on a message of love, grace, and forgiveness that's only found in Jesus. I can't believe that they risked their lives for a lottery ticket. It just doesn't make sense. I, I can't believe that they would sacrifice everything for basically what we would call wishful thinking. There's something don't add up. And that's why I love John 16, because John 16 teaches us how. No, no, no. John 16 teaches us how better, how hope works. I'm going to keep you engaged. How hope works, what hope really is, and how hope works. I'm telling you, if you don't need hope right now, you're going to need it. Buckle up. Life has a way of handing you situations where you're going to need some hope. But some of y'all right now, I know for a fact you walked in these doors and you need hope right now. Some of y'all watching online, you need hope right now. We had, a, we had a young woman who attended our service on Thursday night and she said, you don't understand the situation I've been. I've, I've been through death. I've been through loss. I'm a, I'm a single mom now. I've been through everything. And all I needed was hope. I'm telling you, we desperately, desperately need hope. In John 16, I think Jesus gives us a sneaky little Christmas message and clarifies what hope really is. So Peak City, John chapter 16, we're gonna be in verse 16. I say this every week. I don't say it to get any sort of response for me. I say it because Jesus would often begin or end a teaching by saying something like, he who has ears, let him hear. It was Jesus' way of saying, you gotta position your mind and your heart and your soul to receive. You have to be ready that God wants to teach you. God wants to grow us if we will say that we are open to it and prepared for it. So, Peak City, John 16, hope, 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 how hope works. Are you ready? Yes. Uh, 16 people are ready. <laughs> 16 people are getting hope. I'm telling you, I don't, I don't care if, if it's only 16 that get it. We will preach our guts out to get 16 people hope right now. Peak City, are you ready for hope? Yes. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. John 16, verse 16. Here's what it says. We go back through it. It says, Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more than after a little while you will see me. He's actually trying, we're going to see this in a second. He's trying to give him hope right there. He says that this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you'll see me no more, <clears throat> then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while we don't understand what he is saying? Now Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. And so he said to them, he steps into the situation. He says, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you'll, just see, me. you'll see me? The, 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 the disciples here are confused. Okay, they're confused. Raise your hand if you've ever read anything in the Bible or heard anything in, in church that confused you. If you're not raising your hand right now, you're a liar. And that's okay. You're welcome here. But it is confusing sometimes, right? And the, 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 the disciples are confused. And so Jesus says, not only do I want to bring clarity to your confusion, but Jesus knows what they're about to face. Okay, Jesus knows, this, 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 the, the, John 16 is known as the farewell discourse. This is Jesus preparing his disciples for a really, really hard time that they're about to enter into. Jesus is preparing them for the time when he will be crucified. He will be murdered. The, the leader of the movement will die and it's gonna scare them to death. They're entering into a season of hardship and he says, for anyone who's confused, anyone who's in a dark season right now, or anyone who's about to go into a dark season, he says, what you need is And so now he's trying to think, how can I explain to them? They're confused. They're confused. They don't get it. I'm trying to give them, I'm trying to give them hope, but they don't get it yet. So how can, I, how can I explain it to them? And I just got to believe in this moment. He thinks of someone. I think he might have actually saw someone as he says these next words. He says, here's how I'll explain hope to you. Very truly, I tell you in verse 20. Very true, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve 
but your grief will turn to joy. Here's the Christmas vibes. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born unto the world. Joy to the world, for the Lord has come. So with you, he says, now, now let's take it to you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. He says, let me try to explain hope to him. And we don't have a roster of who was present at the moment. Oftentimes the Bible doesn't tell us every single person that was there for something that happened. Sometimes we see it was the disciples. Sometimes we know that there were other people besides the disciples hanging out. And I just got to believe, like if I was a bet man, and I am, if, 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 if I read this text, I see in here, I bet you that the disciples were there and I bet you his mama was there. I bet you he looked across the room when he said, how can I, how can I explain to them how hope works? And he locked eyes with Mary. And he said, oh, I know how. I, I, I'll tell them how hope works. And he started to tell the story of his own birth to explain hope to them. Because you know, you know, you know. You know that Jesus' birth story was one of those stories that everyone talked about at every family gathering. This was like family legend that got passed around. They were always talking because it was crazy story, right? Like, I'm sure Jesus, when he was a kid, he, he probably overheard his mama with a small group of ladies from the church over for Bible study. I bet he heard her telling the story like, oh, ladies, if you could have seen the looks that those women in the grocery store shot me when they saw my baby bump and I told them that God was the father. <laughs> you should have seen the look that Becky with the good hair gave me. My goodness. She thought I was crazy. You, you got to know, you got to know that you know, Jesus, when he was a, you know, annoying kid to his mom at some point, you know, procrastinating on something. I know some of you are like, whoa, whoa, Jesus was perfect. I, I know he was perfect, but procrastinate, pro, pro, procrastination is not a sin. It's just annoying, right? And so, so Jesus annoying his mom, I bet you his mom was like, Jesus, I did not ride on a donkey all the way to Bethlehem to have you act like this. When Joseph got mad about things, like, oh, I've seen that look before. That was the look, that's the steam coming out of his ears that night. Just like that night when the, when the innkeeper said, there ain't no room here. It's the same anger I've seen in your dad, you know? These are the stories that, that Jesus grew up hearing. And so in this moment, he's trying to find an illustration. How can I explain how hope works to them? And, 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 and all of a sudden, he sees Mary. And even if she wasn't there, it actually doesn't matter. I think he was thinking of her at, at least. And he thought, I'll explain hope by referencing my mom and what she went through. And he says, just like a woman who's giving birth and she's going through pain, but her pain and her grief goes away the minute she sees her child that is born unto the world, it, her grief turns into joy. That's kind of how hope works. And then he says, and now I wanna take this and I wanna, I wanna relate it to your life. And he says these words, I'm gonna say them to you a lot over the next little bit, because I, 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 I want you to receive them and really plant them deep into your heart. He says, now is your time of grief. Now is your time of grief. But he says, in the midst of your grief, don't worry, you will see me again. And when you do, you will rejoice and no one will be able to take away your joy. Now is your time of grief, he says. But you will see me again and when you do, you will rejoice and no one will be able to take away your joy. I'm gonna say it a third time. He says, now is your time of grief but you will see me again and when you do, you will rejoice and no one will be able to take away your joy. I believe in Jesus' words right here. We have a picture of how hope works. And I wanna show you what I believe God was showing me as I was praying through this passage and I, as, as, as I was asking God to illuminate this to me and help me understand what it means, I, I, I couldn't help but see hope all over it and I couldn't help but see that hope works in a cycle. Okay, I wanna take you to my journal. I wanna take you to uh, my own handwriting. I'm sorry that it, it looks like chicken scratch. My, my seven-year-old daughter got better handwriting than I do. So you have to excuse me on that front. But I, 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 I just wanna show you what I wrote in my journal when I read this passage. And, and to me, I just saw it popping off the page that this is how hope works. Go ahead and put that up there for us, okay? Excuse the chicken scratch, but this is what I think we see from Jesus in John 16, that this is how hope works. He says, now is your time of Grief. Hope always begins with grief. You can't have hope without going through grief. 
You can't have joy without going through sadness. You, 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 you can't experience the fullness of life without going through the hardships of life. He says, now is your time of grief, but he says, don't lose hope. Because in the midst of your grief, he says, you will see me again. That you will see God again in the midst of your grief. And when God shows up in your grief, when God shows up in your hardship, I'm telling you, your grief will turn to joy. Your mourning will turn to dancing. Your ashes will turn into beauty, he says, when you see God show up in the midst of your grief. Your grief will turn to joy when you see God. But And here's the deal, it'll be so powerful. This experience of seeing God show up in your hardship, it'll be so powerful that no one will be able to take away your joy. It'll be a story of the faithfulness of God that is so deeply planted in you that, that people, may dis- uh, 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 people may doubt it, people may not know all the details, people may not fully understand it, but you do. You remember because you were there. You were in the grief, you felt it, and you saw God show up, and you saw your grief turn to joy, and that joy became something so deep inside of you, it became trust. It became trust, and no one, no one could take it away from you. You've been through too much, you've seen God do too much, and here's the deal, it doesn't end there, it's a cycle. This is how what works? How what works? Okay. Grief turns to joy. Joy turns to trust is deep rooted. You've seen God do it in your life before. And your, that trust prepares you for your next round with grief. The trust prepares you because the grief isn't over. You made it through one storm. Guess what? Another storm's coming. You made it through one season of hardship. Guess what? Another one is on the horizon. And, and, and what God says is you need and hope is not a lottery ticket. It's not wishful thinking. It's not something unstable. It's not I hope happens. No, it's hope is I've already seen God do it in the past. So now I've got joy because of what he's done in my life. And my joy has become trust and no one can take it away from me. So the next storm that comes, I'm standing strong. I'm planting myself. No one can take away my joy. That's what hope is. This is how hope works. Now, I want to show you in the lives of people, how this actually works. Not just like, oh man, preacher needed something to talk about on Christmas, so he made up a weird drawing. <laughs> I wanna show you, this, this is how hope works, okay? I wanna just, uh, let, let, let's, start with like, um, let's start with Mary. Okay, it's Christmas, let's talk about one of the Christmas nativity scene stars. Mary, <clears throat> Mary's story starts with grief. She's a completely unplanned, unexpected teen pregnancy with no husband when most likely she was living in poverty. She's terrified. She's terrified of the future. She's been promised by God that she's gonna carry the Messiah, the Son of God, and she's like, what is happening to my life? The looks people give me, the things, the rumors that were spreading about her. Oh, it was awful. She's going through grief. But then she sees Jesus. And when she sees Jesus, she sees that God came through on his promises and her grief turns to joy. Read Luke chapter two, Mary's Magnificat. She says, magnify the Lord, oh my soul, for what he has done. He has turned my grief into joy and her joy, come on, come on, come on. When she saw God show up in her grief, her joy became something that no one could take away from her. She remembers the story. She remembers the details. She lived it. She saw the faithfulness of God. No one could take it from her. Her joy became trust and her trust prepared her for the future rounds of grief that she would face. You know, she wasn't done facing grief. She she went through grief in the beginning. Uh, She actually went through a lot more grief. In fact, we see that that, that she had what? Because at the end of Jesus's life, fast forward to the end, another round of grief for Mary also for Jesus, but also for Mary. Jesus is hanging on a cross. The son that she gave birth to is being murdered. And the disciples, almost all of them fled the scene. Almost all of them abandoned Jesus. Almost all of them were scared. They thought the death of the leaders, the death of the movement. And all of a sudden, who's there? You got the disciple John and his mama is at the foot of the cross as her son is being killed. And she's standing firm, confident, And she's filled with, because she's seen God do it before. She says, I've been here before. I've been in grief and I saw my God and and, and he turned my grief into joy and joy became trust. And now I'm in a storm, but I've I've been here before. 
God's given me what I need. I've got. You have to stay stronger than that. I need you this whole sermon. This is a team effort, okay? This is a team effort. Because she had. Thank you. This is how hope works. This is how hope works, okay? Let's go to another one. Um, uh, let's go with the disciples, okay? The, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He says, now is your time of grief. They're about to endure grief. They're gonna see the leader of their movement murdered and they're gonna think it's over. And most of them thought it was over. Peter denied ever even knowing him. <laughs> Judas betrayed him. I mean, most of the disciples fled like cowards. But he says, in the midst of your grief, don't lose hope because you will see me again. And all of a sudden, three days later, Jesus resurrects from the dead and they see him again. And not a hallucination, not a ghost. He comes up and says, touch my nail scarred hands. Touch them. Let's eat breakfast together. Let's hang out for days together. It's not a hallucination. It's not a fairy tale. I was dead and now I'm alive. And their grief was turned into joy. And no one could take their joy away. They would never be able to forget and no one could tell them otherwise. They saw a man dead on the cross and then they saw him alive again three days later and it changed everything about them. All of a sudden they had hope. They had this deep trust because of what they had seen God do in their lives and it prepared them. You've got to catch this. It prepared them for the next round of grief. The disciples would be the ones who carried the mission of God throughout the world. Only this time because they had they would actually face persecution just like Jesus. M many of them were crucified just like Jesus. Some of them were crucified upside down. Some of them were brutally murdered, but they didn't flee like cowards, no. A storm came and they planted themselves because they had, this is how hope works. Can I, can I share one more with you? Can, can you humor me for just one, 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 one more? Okay. Um, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna blow your mind for a second. Because yes, it's true in people's lives. Like the proof is in the pudding of people's lives. I want you to zoom out for a second. I want to blow your mind at a macro level and show you that this is how hope works, not just in individual lives, but for our entire humanity. All of existence, all of civilization, all of human history is one big episode of hope. You zoom out and it's just God telling a story of hope. We start with grief. The world is created and we screw it up. Adam and Eve, yeah, 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 but you and me. It ain't just Adam and Eve. The world is screwed up because you're in it. The world's screwed up because I'm in it. And, and, and sin separates us from God and the world is broken, but then we see the Lord. Jesus shows up on the scene and our grief turns to joy. We have reconciliation with God. We have a mission and oh my gosh, no one can take away what Jesus has done in our lives. And now we have this deep trust and now it prepares us for the grief we're in right now. Come on, you know, we're still in grief. We're still in hardship right now. The world is still broken and messed up, but we can stand firm because we have and get this, it's a cycle. God's not done. Christmas was the first time Jesus came, but he's gonna come again. And this time when he comes, our grief will turn to joy. There will be no more sin. There will be no more evil. We will trust him with everything we have. But this time it ain't gonna prepare us for grief. This time it's gonna prepare us for glory. It's gonna prepare, going to prepare us for life with Jesus. Unhindered, uninterrupted, all evil is gone and Jesus is king. This is how it works. The, the whole world and everything in it is one big episode of hope. It's God trying to get your attention and say, let me show up in the midst of your grief. Now, <clears throat> I, need to, I need to do something with our last little bit together that is gonna be a little bit invasive and it's gonna hurt, okay? That's why I asked our team, I said, hey, I need, I, need, I need to make them feel like warm and fuzzy for like a minute before, I, before we do this. So I didn't, have a, I didn't have a good story, I didn't have a good joke. I'm not a good joke teller anyways. So I said, can you take my chicken scratch and like make it into a Christmas card, something that looks and feels warm. Can you put that up, thank you. Can you put that up for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, doesn't that look better? <laughs> Praise God for graphic designers. <laughs> okay, now that you laughed a little bit and now that you feel warm and fuzzy. I needed you to feel warm and fuzzy for a minute because I feel like what we need to do is you need to understand that yes, this is how hope works in the stories of the past. Yes, this is how hope works in humanity. Our, our whole story is a story of hope, but I need you to understand that this isn't actually for someone else. This isn't for the person you're sitting next to. This isn't for the person you wish was here. This is how hope works in your life. That this is actually for you 
This is for you. Don't think about the person next to you. Think about you. God wants to write a story of hope in your life. And so I just want to say what Jesus said to the disciples. I want to say it to you and I want you to personalize it. And it's going to hurt because hope has to start with grief. I want to just repeat the words of Jesus to you. And and I know it's not what you want to hear on Christmas, but it's true. I want you to hear this. Now is your time of grief. For some of you, you know exactly what I'm saying because you're in it right now. The pain you feel right now, it's real. The pain you feel, I'm telling you, you shouldn't ignore it. It The pain of infertility, the pain of miscarriage, the pain of addiction, the pain of divorce, the pain of financial pressure, the pain of suicide, the pain of, of being a leader and have to make tough decisions that affect lots of people. Man, the pain is real. And if now is not your time of grief, let this be a warning, it's coming. Maybe 2024, I know it's like 2024, new year, new you. It might be new year, new you. It also might be new year, just new storm that you're about to walk into. Now is your time of grief. And it it sucks and it's horrible. I'm telling you, I I want you to know, God, whatever you're feeling right now, whatever whatever pain you're experiencing, God sees it. He actually hurts with you. He hurts alongside you. Whatever you're feeling, whatever's crushing your soul, it's crushing his. Now is your time of grief. But I came today to be an ambassador of hope in this room to you, to tell you that yes, now is your time of grief. But I came today to tell you that you will see him again. You will see God work in your life. You will see God show up in the midst of your brokenness. You will see him show up in the storm. I'm telling you, when you see God show up, your grief will turn to joy. Mourning will turn to dancing. We're going to see some dancers in here in 2024. Some people that can't believe God showed up. I'm telling you, God is not, if you're not dead, God is not done in your life. He wants to show up in your life. He wants to show up in your storm. I'm telling you, your your grief, yes, it's real, but you're going to see him again. And when you do, oh my gosh, no one will be able to take away your joy. No one. It's going to be a story. It's going to be a testimony that when you tell people, they, they won't even believe it. And it's going to develop in you something that no one else sees, something that no one else knows about. It's a deep sense of trust. It's a deep abiding trust in you that says, God did it before. I could never deny that he turned my grief to joy. And because of that, I trust him. And now you, ha- you are prepared for your next round with grief. I'm so, you're going to get here. God's going to show up in your life. Uh, my, my, my wife and I say this to each other all the time. We have seen too much. I've seen too much to ever go back on God. I've seen him rebuild our marriage when it should have ended. I've seen him rebuild this church when it should have ended. I've seen him break addictions. I've seen him repair marriages. I've seen him take atheists and and, and agnostics in this church and turn them into wholehearted followers of Jesus. I've seen him do too much. In fact, like right now, if you can attest to this, If you have a story where God showed up in your grief and turned it to joy and it's become trust in you, if you've got, I want you to stand right now as a testimony to the other people in this room, if that's your story. Yeah, 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 look around, look around. Now the rest of you can stand up too. I don't want you to feel left out. (laughs) If you didn't stand just now, or it was a delayed stand because you're just not sure, I want you to look around at the people who stood up quick. And if you don't have hope, borrow ours. If you don't have belief, borrow ours. God is not done in your life. He wants to give you, but here's the D, here's here's the truth. God won't force his way into your life. He won't force hope into your life. You know, it says joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. What's that next line? Let every heart prepare him room. You have to make room for God in your life. You have to actually say, God, I, I, I know that I'm in grief, but I need you to move in my life. And I open my heart to you, open my life to you. Jesus, I want to follow you. You got to make a decision to let God into your life. You must prepare him room. He's not going to force his way in. And, and, and I want to give some of you the chance to make that decision today. Maybe it's a very first time decision. We've had nearly 20 people over the past 
two services from Thursday night and Sunday night who have made the decision to start following Jesus this Christmas. And I wanna give you the chance to do the same. You don't have to have your life figured out. You don't have to have the Bible memorized. You don't have to know all the answers. You just have to be ready to say yes to starting this journey with God. Yes to his love and to his hope. As some of you, I think there's maybe a broken situation. Maybe you would consider yourself a Christian, but there's a broken situation that you need to say, God, I need you to show up. I'm in grief, but I want to have hope. And maybe just between you and God, you just, you just admit it to him. God, I need you to show up in this area of my life. Either way, we wanna give you a chance to make a life-changing decision like we do every Sunday at Peak City. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're new with us, this is Peak City tradition. We do this every week. If you're here and you wouldn't have maybe considered yourself a Christian even as you walked into this room today, but you know that Jesus is the one who's been pursuing you. You know that he's the one you've actually been looking for this whole time. And that what he did for you on the cross, that it is enough for you to say, Jesus, here I am, I'm ready to follow you. If that's a decision you wanna make to become a Christian today, Christmas 2023, to change your life and go in a completely different direction, to start following Jesus for the very first time, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three as a private decision between you and God. One, two, three. It's awesome. It's so good. We're so excited for you. You just made that decision. If you made it online, let us know in the chat. For those of you that made that decision in the room, we're so grateful for you. We're so excited for what God has in store for you. Peak City, keep your heads bowed and eyes closed, but let's join heaven and celebrate the decisions that were just made in the room. With your heads bowed and eyes still closed, if you have a situation in your life, it's a relationship, it's a, a mental health issue, it's, it's a, a financial, relational job issue, there's a calling, there's some confusion in your life, you just know there's, there's a broken situation in your life and you need hope. It's a great opportunity for you to say, God, I'm open to whatever you want to do. I want to have eyes to see and ears to hear. I want you to turn my grief to joy. I want to have hope. If you want to have hope in a broken situation in your life specifically, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Hands up all over the room. All over the room. Jesus, we love you. We need you. Every hand that is raised, we say, come Lord Jesus. Bring hope to hopeless places in our lives. Would your light shine in the darkness, God? Would you do what only you can do, Jesus? And no matter what, God, we're gonna keep declaring that you are worthy of our attention, worthy of our affection, and worthy of our praise. And so, Jesus, we offer our lives to you right now, and we sing to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this Peak City message today. If you'd like more information on Peak City Church or if you'd like to give to the mission here in Colorado Springs, then check us out at peakcityco.com.